Chapter 9 Into the Valley of Goats The small cave where Grug and his companions spent the night had been used as a shelter by members of the Mountain Battalion on many occasions. Most of the uncomfortable rocks had been removed from the floor, and there was even a table and chairs made from whittled pine where the party ate a meager dinner of bread, dried pork, and cheese. But despite the fact that Grug was able to lay out his canvas swag and woolen blanket on flat, dry earth, and had been given a small flask of whiskey by Major Hammerbuckle that he took to bed with him, he was still unable to sleep. It wasn't the sound of the watchtower horn that kept him awake this time. In fact, it was the absence of it. It was possible that they were just too far away to hear it, However, Grog suspected that the sound had stopped because the dwarves and Kavina on the watchtower had once again been overwhelmed by the horrible, vengeful dwarves and their undead minions. Either way, the only sounds Grog had to keep him company as he lay in the thick darkness of the cave were the ringing of his own ears and the screams and cries of panic and pain, which had echoed in his mind every night since the Battle of Algon's Pass more than a year ago. He imagined what might have happened in Longdale, where Broughton was organizing the defense of the town. He imagined scores of grotesque undead hurling themselves against the doors of the Hall of Legends, while little Gretton cowered inside, clinging to her grandfather. He imagined all the wonderful towns and taverns he'd visited across the Thirteen Realms during his time in the army. All under attack. All burning. All desperately needing help to come charging down from the mountain tops. Maurog. Crodus's deep voice and an accompanying nudge from the toe of his boot brought Grog back to consciousness. Grog looked up. Crawdis was standing over him. He was already dressed for travel, with his light blue cape wrapped around his shoulders, and his amber eyes glowing faintly from beneath the rim of his gold helmet. I've made breakfast, Crawdis said, before turning away and making for the mouth of the cave, where dawn light was painting the walls a pale grey. Grug sat up, rubbed the sleep out of his eyes, and sniffed. The smell of smoke and fried eggs was wafting into the cave, and Grug wasted no time in disentangling himself from his blankets and seeking out the source of the smell. Tarion and the dwarf in titanium chainmail, who'd finally introduced himself to Grug the previous evening as Orofam Warbraids, were sitting on rocks next to a crackling campfire. Crawdis was crouched down, scraping eggs off an iron skillet and onto some enamel plates. Major Hammerbuckle was standing on a boulder nearby, silhouetted against the rising sun and looking north towards the mountain summit. And here he is, everybody, Tyrion said, an open hand pointed towards Grog. The lady snoring dwarf in all the thirteen realms. I can't have been snoring that much, Grog protested. I hardly slept a wink. Oh, you got a wink or two? Tyrion assured him. I was on last watch this morning, and it was like there was a dire bear choking to death in the cave. Sorry, Grug said with a sheepish shrug. Not much I can do about it, really. How's your head? Crawdis asked as he passed Grug a plate of fried bread and eggs. Sure. Grug gingerly touched a finger to his cranium. But on the mend... Thanks for breakfast. Crawdis gave Grog a stiff nod and handed a plate to Orofam. You uh, see any sign of anything down there? Grog asked Orofam as he sat down next to him. Orofam, who'd been squinting back towards Longdale, shook his head. Tid dark, te misty, cannot say a thing. Grog took a bite of his egg-covered bread and let out a little grunt of satisfaction. Oh, Crawdis, what did you put on this? 
Just some dried herbs and salt. Is it all right? Fuck and delicious, Grug said, taking another huge bite and wiping yolk from his bushy black moustache. You know you just damned yourself to be cook for the rest of this quest, don't you? Orofim said, licking his fingertips. That's all right, Crowdis said. I like cooking. You can wash the dishes. Orofim looked like he was about to reject this proposal, but at that moment, Major Hammerbuckle came striding out of the gloom. Grog, I want to talk to you about the route you said we should take. Hmm? <laughs> Grog mumbled his mouth completely full of egg and bread. The Major held up a map he'd taken from the Burgomaster's library. He'd made Grog look at it with him by moonlight before they'd attempted to sleep. Now he was shaking it in Grog's direction and looking even more angry than usual. The way I see it, the Major said, stepping around the fire and squatting down next to Grog. If we head northwest along this valley... He stabbed the map with a calloused finger. Then travel directly north across the tundra of Realm 13. That's the quickest way to get to Mount Valkeen. It's the shortest distance, Grug said, but it's not a good idea. Major Hammerbuckle's eyes narrowed, the black striped war paint across his cheekbones creasing. Why not? Because it's rough terrain? Because it's cold? I'm not scared of a few hills and a little snow. And I'm sure no one else is here. Except maybe you, Mao Grog. Maybe you just want to go east and take the long way around because it's easier. No. Grog wiped his greasy fingers on his grey woolen shirt and reached for the map. It's because the only way to get into Realm 13 from here, unless you want to climb right over the top of this mountain range, is through this valley and... That's what I said. Major Hammerbuckle snatched the map back. We go through this valley, then it's a clear run north. Grog mopped up some yolk with his last piece of bread, popped it in his mouth, and chewed slowly while the Major fumed. No, Major, he said eventually. What happens if we go that way is we enter the valley. Then we get attacked by mountain trolls. Then we all get eaten. Then no one ever reaches Mount Velkin, and the Facebound never even hear about our troubles. Mountain trolls? Major Hammerbuckle's voice was thick with scepticism. Do the great goat herds use that valley to migrate north into Realm 13 in the spring? Grug explained. They go to eat the grasses coming up beneath the snow melt and the trolls come down from the high mountains to eat the goats. And you think we can't handle a few trolls? The Major asked. It'll save us days, maybe weeks. Grug shrugged. It might, or we might end up as troll shite. Have you ever seen a mountain troll? They're at least three times taller than a dwarf. If there's a chance to make this journey significantly shorter, the Major said, folding the map and stowing it away beneath his mustard cape. And the only thing standing in our way is a few mangy trolls. Then we're going that way. Grug knew there was no point in arguing. Fine, he said, standing up and dusting the crumbs off his night pants. Now, nobody come in the cave for a minute. I need to try and squeeze into the skinny bastard's clothes again. He inclined his head towards Crodis. Ah, it's not something anyone needs to witness. A short while later, the party was travelling northwest across the face of the mountain. Major Hammerbuckle was leading the way and setting a cracking pace. Grog was bringing up the rear, smoking a pipe as he walked, and stopping every thirty or forty paces to adjust Crodis's leather breeches which kept uncomfortably riding up around his groin and buttocks. Grog had sensibly packed the pipe with a mixture of Nissan weed and a regular short belly leaf. It was going to take the edge off his various aches and pains, but he wasn't hallucinating or craving honey nut pastries. The sun at Grog's back 
had only just emerged from beneath the dark blanket of the world. And, as they began descending into the valley, the air was becoming thick with morning mist. Grog tripped and stumbled in the feeble light, but he wasn't the only one. Orifem, Terrian, and Major Hammerbuckle all took turns at swearing and roaring as they stubbed their toes or turned their ankles. Only Crodis seemed immune to any mishaps, and Grug began to suspect that the quiet dwarf's fiery eyes allowed him to see in the dark. It wasn't until after the sun had passed overhead and they reached the valley floor that the Major allowed the party to stop for a rest. Sweat was dripping from the end of Grug's bulbous nose, and Nissenweed, or no Nissenweed, he was still suffering from a rotten headache, a throbbing buttock, and some rather nasty chafing of the inner thighs. But he didn't complain. He just flopped down on a patch of clover and began digging around in his backpack for his flask of whiskey. Are you sure you wouldn't be better off with just some water? Crawdis asked after Grog had found his flask and taken several burning gulps. Grog looked around at the others. Orifem and the Major were drinking greedily from large leather water skins, the water trickling down their beards in glittering droplets. Terrian was taking delicate sips, being careful not to smear the grey and white layers of paint which intersected at her chin. Well, maybe just a mouthful. Grog said, unclipping his own water skin from his backpack. I always used to lecture my troops about keeping their water up on long marches. Stop the buggers from fainting. He drank. Better than ale, yes? Crodis suggested. Better than! Better than! Grog's words temporarily failed him. This! Grog held up the water skin. You think this lukewarm, goat leather tasting piss is better than a cold, foamy tankard of delicious ale? Better for you, at least. Aye. Grug pressed the wooden stopper back into the mouth of his water skin. And they say walking's good for you, too. And yet here I am, feeling like someone's poured acid down the insides of my bloody legs. No time for wine and mow grog, Major Hammerbuckle said, shouldering his peck. Let's keep going. Grog swallowed his anger and stood up, stifling a groan of pain. Maybe we could ride some of these. He looked past the Major to the steady stream of large goats that was making their way west along the valley floor. That way the trolls can get their dinner and dessert all in one go. The Major followed Grog's gaze. Oh, yes, for trolls. And, uh, where exactly might these monsters be hiding? There's no caves, hardly any trees, no place to hide at all, really. It just looks like lovely grass all the way from here to Realm 13. I really hope you're right, Grog said. I haven't been this way in a while. Maybe there won't be trolls. He shared a lame smile with the rest of the party, and was slightly bewildered to see a definite look of disappointment crumple Terrian's face. But there probably will be, he added. Terrian's mismatched eyes lit up. This was one strange Kavina. The attack came at sunset, which was the worst possible time of day, for three enormous trolls to come lumbering up the valley from the west. The sun was shining directly into Grog's eyes, so the shapes of the trolls were nothing more than dark smudges in the distance at first. But the thunderous roars and snarls, which echoed progressively louder off the rocky walls of the valley, made it clear that the trolls weren't out for a casual evening stroll. Ah, they've smelled us, Grog said, shrugging off his peck and sliding his two short swords out of their sheaths. Fuck! Major Hammerbuckle growled as he dumped his own pack onto the grass and began unclipping his two-handed battle axe from its side. Come on, then, Grog, say it. Say I told you so. There'll be time for that after. 
Grug said loudly, then muttered under his breath, If we survive, you stupid bastard. Any way out of this other than a fight? Crodus asked, looking back at Grug. Not really, pal. Grug made a show of looking at their surroundings. The valley was wide and open, with a gushing stream cutting through the middle of it. There were scattered trees and some fairly sizable boulders around, but there'd be no hiding from the keen noses of the trolls, and certainly no outrunning their long, knobble-kneed legs. I'm afraid that's us or them. Oh, it's gonna be them! Orifam bellowed as he clambered onto a boulder with a hefty axe in his hand. Crodis sighed and unslung the two hatchets that he kept strapped to his backpack. The trolls were closing fast. They were close enough already for Grog to see the mottled grey skin of their legs and torsos, and their dismally inadequate goat-hide loincloths flapping around their dangling nether regions. Terrian undid the clasp of her garnet-coloured cape. She unhurriedly folded it and placed it on top of her backpack. Spread out a bit, Major Hammerbuckle shouted, advancing towards the trolls. Try and flank them. The tall, lanky beasts were fifty paces away. One was carrying a club that was little more than a stripped tree branch. Another had no weapons, apart from its long, sinewy arms and mouth full of jagged teeth. The third was brandishing what could only be described as half a dead goat. Terrian pulled a lethal-looking chain mace from her backpack. The solid steel ball, which dropped by her side as she stood up, was studded with large spikes. She began running towards the troll. The battle cries of the attacking monsters reached a climax as they bore down on Major Hammerbuckle. The leading troll raised the club over his head. Grug squeezed the grips of his short swords and followed Terrian. Then there was nothing but blurred movement, roaring, shouting, swinging weapons, and the pounding of Grog's heart. Major Hammerbuckle threw himself forwards as the club descended. He avoided the crushing blow and came out of his roll with his axe swinging. It sliced across the lead troll's thigh. The creature screamed in pain and buckled to its knees. Grug had time to think, a good start, as the mustard-caped major drew back his axe, ready to take the head off the now-kneeling troll. But then, half a goat slammed into the major, sending him sprawling to the ground. The troll holding the dead goat by one of its horns lifted a massive foot, ready to stomp the prone dwarf into oblivion. Instead, it suddenly staggered backwards, its yellow eyes wide with surprise, as a hatchet thudded into its gut. The grug vaguely registered that this weapon must have been thrown by Crodis, but didn't have time to congratulate his companion, as the unarmed troll had picked up a rock that was half the size of a dwarf and was preparing to hurl it. Grug altered course, making for the cover of the large boulder that Orifem had been standing on. He hadn't seen where the titanium-clad warrior had gone, but he could hear him shouting. The troll heaved the rock, not at Grog, who was preparing to dive behind the boulder, but at Terrian, who was closing within striking distance. She did not break stride, but merely leaned her head slightly to one side. The rock hurtled over her left shoulder, missing her by a finger's width and plowing harmlessly into the ground. Then she attacked, and Grog saw at once why this Kavina had been painted with the markings of an ultimate warrior. He understood why she'd attained a rank that was granted to only a handful of dwarves and Kavina every generation. She moved with the speed of a cat, the ferocity of a rabid cave demon, and the precision of of a royal surgeon. Her mace was a devastating blur, which whipped down and pulverized the toes of the unarmed troll, then flicked up to crack it under its chin as it reached for her. As the troll reeled back, hopping and clutching its shattered bloody chin with both hands, Terrian swung her mace at its non-injured leg and tore away its kneecap. The troll toppled like a felled tree, 
Terrian spun out of the way, then jumped onto the back of the stricken creature, already whirling her mace over her head, building up speed and power as she prepared to finish the job. She's got him, Grug thought. I'm just standing here like an idiot. Realizing that he'd been watching Terrian transfixed for more than a few precious seconds, Grug shifted his attention to the other combatants and saw that the rest of his party wasn't faring quite so well. Orifem was lying unmoving in the grass in front of the goat-wielding troll, who was still holding the goat in one hand, but was clutching at a gruesome wound in its side with the other. Black blood was spurting from beneath its fingers. Major Hammerbuckle had regained his feet, but was staggering backwards, away from the troll whose legs he'd sliced open. He held his great battle-axe awkwardly in his left hand. His right arm dangled uselessly by his side. The troll was limping after him, raising its club. Grog leaped towards the troll, the flash of a gold helmet in the corner of his eye, and a deep dwarfish bellow told him that Crodus was beside him. The two dwarves attacked together. The troll changed the angle of its club and swept it sideways in a wide arc, trying to take out both of them in a single blow. Crodus dropped, and the club whooshed over him. Grog considered flattening himself on the ground, but decided that he might not be able to get quite flat enough. His next idea was to leap backwards, but there was no way he was going to change direction in time. These thoughts whizzed through his mind in less than an instant. Unfortunately for Grog, less than an instant was all the time the troll needed to smack him fair on the ribs with its tree branch. He flew sideways, crashing to the ground, and coming to rest next to the senseless body of Orifem. Every particle of breath had been knocked from Grog's body, and pain blazed like fire through his torso. But, thanks to Blade Blunter, he was alive, and miraculously still held hold of one of the short swords. He rolled onto his back in time to see the goat-wielding troll lifting something from the grass. It was Orifem's battle axe, the blade was slicked with black blood, and it was also being raised directly over Grog and Orifem. This time, Grog didn't hesitate. He lunged and stabbed upwards with his sword, right into the dangling and woefully unprotected genitals of the unfortunate troll. Hot blood and possibly other fluids washed over Grog's forearm. The troll dropped both goat and axe and staggered backwards, its ear-splitting screams filling the valley. Grog flicked the worst of the gunk off his arm and turned back towards the troll with the club. It was bearing down on Crodis, who was doing his best to dodge, duck, and generally avoid the wild swipes of the giant club. Major Hammerbuckle was leaning against the boulder just behind Crodis. He dropped his axe and was pressing his mustard-colored cloak against the bicep of his right arm. Grug had time to register the dark stain spreading across the cloak, before a roar from the last troll grabbed his attention. The creature was on its knees. Terrian stood behind it with a bloody dagger in one hand, and her fearsome mace whirling in the other. Grug closed his eyes just before the mace made contact with the side of the troll's head, the wet crunch he heard an instant later was all the sensory information he needed to know that Terrian's blow had landed. He made the mistake of opening his eyes in time to see Terrian making sure of her kill by bringing her mace down again and again on the back of the prone creature's cranium, spattering bits of skull and brain across the grass. The other troll that Terrian had engaged was in a similar state of unquestionable deadness. The troll that Grog had so mercilessly stabbed in the gonads, however, was still very much alive. It was curled in a fetal position, howling pitifully. Mm, for the love of all that's holy, Crotus shouted, put us out of its misery. Grog hesitated. Terrian didn't. She jumped off the back of the dead troll and headed for its tortured comrade. As he watched her go, Grog was greatly relieved to see Orifem sitting up, clutching his head, but apparently not mortally wounded. Oh no. 
Major! The trembling quiver in Crodus's deep voice sent a shiver of fear creeping across Grog's shoulders. He turned his head slowly, not wanting to see what had rattled the amber-eyed warrior so badly, but suspecting that he already knew. Major Hammerbuckle had now slumped to the ground. His head and shoulder were resting against the boulder. His left hand was still pressed against his right bicep. His eyes were drooping shut. He was completely soaked in blood. Break your artery, Crodus, Crodus said, dropping his hatchet and squatting down beside the major. Fuck, he began unclasping his blue cape. We need a tourniquet. Leave it, Major Hammerbuckle said, his voice a husky gasp. Let me go. Crodus pressed his palms against his forehead, and Grog was surprised to see tears streaming down the face of the stern and stalwart dwarf. Grog knelt down in front of the Major. He'd seen injuries like this before, and knew the Major was right. It was too late. This dwarf's life was soaked into his clothes, smeared across the boulder, and pooling on the grassy earth in the golden rays of sunset. Last requests? Grog asked, keeping his words as quick and simple as possible. Give all my stuff to my sister, except this. The Major tapped a blood-covered thumb against the obsidian gem on his cloak. This goes to my Uncle Dagiv. Grug nodded. We will. The screaming of the final troll stopped, and the valley was plunged into an abrupt and tranquil silence. And the Major's eyes rolled in their sockets, and his head flopped onto his chest. When his voice was a slurred whisper. Fucking We will, Grug said, as the Major's body sagged lifeless and still against the blood-drenched stone. We will.